It's the Autosport Podcast. We're looking forward to the start of another Formula E season and arguing about how much to expect from new arrival Jaguar. We're just a few days away from the Formula E season opener in Hong Kong. Amazingly, this will be the third year of the All-Electric Championship with Sebastian Buemi defending his title. I'm joined by two of the world's leading Formula E experts. First, we have the man whose voice any Formula E fan will have become very familiar with, Jack Nichols, fresh from the Rio Olympics. Uh, any medals, Jack? Uh, not, not for me. I got to hold one, though, which was quite cool, and I thought about nicking it, but I thought best not to. But it was good fun. That's an achievement. <laughs> yeah, an achievement. thank you. Uh, also joined by Scott Mitchell, not an Olympian. He did watch some Olympics, but he attends every Formula E race for Autosport. He was uh, sunning himself at Donington testing while the Olympics were on. What's new in Formula E, Scott? The the weather in Donington was fantastic, much improved on, on last, last season. So that was uh, definitely a step forward for, for season three. Better than Rio? Oh, almost certainly. Everyone knows that the, the Derbyshire is actually the, the South America of Europe, so... You, you, you're being all dry and ironic, but it w- actually was because it rained so much in Rio. It only got to about 20 degrees maximum, I think. I managed to uh, continue my fantastic Formula E streak of picking up pointless sunburn on the first day <laughs> of literally every event. And I managed that at Donington Park. We've got a great deal of sympathy for uh, the weather Jack and Jern in, uh, in Rio. My name is Ed Straw, the editor-in-chief of Autosport. So, the Formula E season is rapidly bearing down on us. A few changes for this year. So, what did you learn from testing, Scott? Considering there are a couple of uh, small changes on the on the regulation side for for this season, and Jaguar coming in, new team into Cheetah, uh, I guess the the main thing from testing was that that nothing's new. It's still it's still very much Renault leading the way. Sebastian Buemi dipped below the one minute twenty nine mark, which is the first time a Formula E car's ever done that at Donington. Comfortably quickest on on pure pace, led the way on on long runs as well. So actually, <laughs> that was the that was the main lesson from Donington. So we're we're tipping Buemi for another. Yeah, I think so. Renault's not managed to get worse over the summer. They've made small gains to the powertrain that that they felt were you know were necessary to keep it ahead of the pack. And you know when you look at Buemi's pace at Donington, and then you look at the customer to Cheetah team's pace as well with Jean Eric Verne, those were the two that were were locked in a private little battle for fastest lap. They for the majority of the test had the best long runs, and given. Edam's prowess as a team compared to sort of you know no disrespect to the guys that are operating to Cheetah but it's you know it's the majority of the staff from Team Aguri last season and Aguri while very quick at times with Antonio Felix da Costa made a lot of operational errors Edam's has won the team's championship twice in a row now so you have to say that as a team they're favourite the powertrain's the best and Buemi was the champion last season so we know that he's got what it takes as a driver. When we turned up in Beijing though for the first race of season two it was like a two-second advantage or something that Renault had. It was stupid. Are you are you expecting that kind of an advantage this time in Hong Kong? Not not necessarily in Hong Kong. The Beijing last year was a it was anomalous in terms of the advantage Renault had. They were the the benchmark throughout the season, but just the layout of the circuit and combined with maybe the preparation that had gone in with that team compared to the others. You know, they started the season where where they finished really. You know, they they. They may have made small gains operationally over the course of the year, but they they properly hit the ground running. So they had everything sorted in Beijing. The track lent itself really nicely to their to their setup as well. So it was exacerbated in that sense. And generally speaking, this the intimation from testing is very much that actually it's closed up quite a lot. So while Renault goes in as favourite again, Buemi goes in as favourite again, the gaps to the guys behind is actually looking a lot closer than it was last season. And how about apt? Aptaudi Lucas Degrassi almost won the championship last year, so we know we know this new technical cheater team, as I like to call it, is, is going to be in the mix. <laughs> but what, what are we going to see from Degrassi? Is he going to be up there? Well, there was a bit of a suggestion actually going into the final day of testing that that App wasn't necessarily happy uh, when you actually went down to the garage. You know, there weren't frowns on on the engineers. You know, Lucas was 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 quite chipper about about his chances. Very aware that although Audi is going to be up in its game. Uh, over the coming campaign and then next season as a factory entry you know they they do like to point out that that apps are underfunded essentially and under-resourced compared to you know the Renault backed Edam teams the DS backed Virgin team you know the likes of Venturi and Mahindra which are spending quite a lot of money uh, in this championship 
So maybe there was a little bit of a feeling that things weren't quite aligning the way they were last year. I don't personally think I'll ever see a championship like the one Degrassi put together last season. That was sheer perfection from a driving perspective right up until the last race when he completely rear-ended Buemi and you know undid all of his hard work over the over, over the previous eight rounds but on that last day at Donington when things weren't necessarily looking like they were in the mix as much as maybe Renault technical cheater and the DS team Degrassi just pulled these long runs out of the bag on the last day that just threw him to the to the top of the chart in terms of long run pace and then when it actually came to looking at raw lap times as well Daniel Apt and Degrassi were both in the mix on 200 kilowatt runs and we can't read too much into Donington because it's so unrepresentative of what we're going to see street street circuit wise Apt threw themselves into the picture on the final day when the previous five days it might it might have looked like they'd fallen behind I think Degrassi last year was was kind of similar to Fernando Alonso in Formula One in, was it 2012, where he had a car that was substantially worse than any, but he still turned up at the end of the season in title contention. And you go, well, how's he done that? And I'm not quite comparing Lucas de Grassi to uh, Fernando Alonso, but of all the drivers on the grid, he does seem the most consistent, the most able to get um, something out of the car in every E Prix. He's never had a pole position in his entire Formula E career. I don't think he's ever had a fastest lap, possibly one in the first season, but I think it's none. But he was right there to the end in the championship last year. He was right there to the end in season one. It was something like 17 points that Sebastian Vuemi won just from poles and fastest laps last season. So if Formula E didn't give points to them, Degrassi would have won at a canter. I think that shows what he and the app team are able to get out of any car that they have. So I think that'll be exciting. Even if they haven't got a great car, they're going to be up in the mix. Last year, there were times where he did actually under-deliver in qualifying. You know, qualifying was his weak point last year and second half of the season, actually, his younger, more inexperienced teammate, uh, Daniel Apps, you know, ran him close or, or beat him in some sessions. The problem with this season is, whereas last campaign... Uh, a less than ideal qualifying would have left Lucas on the third or the fourth row of the grid. There's actually quite a good chance this year that if you don't get everything lined up in qualifying, and it's so difficult in Formula E to actually nail your 200 kilowatt lap and get into the super pole, let alone do well in the in, in the group session, you're actually probably going to see teams slip from maybe second or third in the pecking order to fourth, fifth or sixth if they mm. don't get the weekend right. Taking Donington... As an example, you know, there was just over a second separating all 10 teams in terms of fastest 200 kilowatt laps. And that gap's only going to shrink when we get to street circuits. So not only are apt maybe a bit more under pressure from the offset from the likes of DS, from from Tachita, you've got to say like Mahindra and Faraday, the Faraday Future Back Dragon team as well. They're, they're going to start under pressure more, but then there's also going to be smaller gaps further back as well. So actually, the, that's the problem Lucas is going to have to overcome and Apt is going to have to overcome as a team. They're going to have to work out how to get the most out of qualifying because if they start further back, I don't think Lucas's job is going to be, you know, I say easy. It wasn't easy for him last season. But that's one of the things that's going to be even trickier. He's going to be recovering from those positions if he starts further down the field. How about to cheater driver-wise? They've got Jean-Éric Verne, a fast driver, a capable driver, but hasn't got a particularly favourable ratio of pole positions to wins in Formula E. So do we think Jev is a guy who can, with the kit under him, actually sustain a championship charge? Because he's been he's been erratic. And this was the case even before Formula E. It was the case in Formula One on his good days. Outstanding, but maybe a few too many errors here and there. I mean, it seemed to me that he couldn't uh, get his head around the energy saving. That's That's been his biggest problem. He turned up in Punta del Este in the, the third ever race in Formula E and put it on pole. And we were all going, oh my goodness, on his you know debut. But... In reality, it was only the third race, so it wasn't actually quite as impressive as I think we thought at the time. It was still a very impressive lap, and he's done it on a few other occasions as well. But in the race, he he just struggles. He started to get it sorted out towards the end of last year. Paris, he had a very strong result, but he was clearly slower than Sam Bird, who was trying to get past him. I mean, I had a little chat with him in um, wherever the Grand Prix was I've just come from, Singapore, because he was out there for Ferrari. And he just seems a lot happier about he wasn't a happy person throughout last year with the virgin team and whether that's because of the team itself or he couldn't get to grips with the car because it was a horrible 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 car that ds virgin built it you know it was like a driving a pendulum with the rear end trying to swap around at every possible opportunity sam bird i think did exceptionally well to control it and actually went up 
an awful lot in my estimations last year. I thought he was pretty decent before, but actually last year I thought he was uh, outstanding, whereas Jev couldn't sort it. But I don't know what you thought from, from testing, Scott, but to me he just seems a lot, well, just a lot happier. Yeah, he's a changed person. He's he's literally, he looks like a different person around around the paddock. Are you he, sure this was Jean-Éric Verne? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to check. Yeah, it's definitely. Was, so Jean-Éric Verne is not the same person as uh, uh, Jean-Carl Verne. Ah, there we go. You're getting confused in your French drivers now. Okay, no, it was definitely Jev, uh, but he's got he's got a smile on his face. You know, there was a moment on in in the second test at Donington where he went out for a 200 kilowatt run. Uh, Buemi had just gone quickest, and I believe had just broken uh, Vern's most recent lap record. And while Buemi and he, uh, Renault Edans were saying, "Oh, you know, we're not going for fastest lap," you could tell that basically every time Jev went out on a 200 kilowatt lap, it was with the incentive of going purple. So he'd just gone something like 200 kilo, uh, two hundredths of a second slower than, than Buemi in the first sector, shunted in the second sector, like <laughs> d- damaged the car quite badly. Back to the pits, l- looked totally unfazed. So he jumps in the second car before the end of the morning session, it goes purple. He talked in Paris after he got his breakthrough podium, his first with the DS team. He talked about it not necessarily being a, a change of fortune. He He was quite philosophical in terms of saying how you do kind of make your own luck he, he needed to react to that better maybe he felt he had been guilty in the past in formula one or, or wherever of letting those situations force him into a negative spiral so he could actually do more as a as an individual to stop that one of the things that is different about the new team with Tachita is jeb's more than a driver there i'm not entirely sure how it works but when you talk to him that's that's his line he feels like he's got the opportunity there to be more than a driver so i think on the outside, it looks really weird. You know, this is a guy who was in F1 recently. You know, he's got four pole positions in in Formula E. He was with DS last season. He's a hot property. Everyone knows he's really quick. So why why the hell would you go with this new team where you don't really know much about them? The suggestion is he's got a stake there somewhere. So it's sort of his team almost. So he's got this sort of maybe freedom to suggest things. I think he now has the confidence that what he says will be listened to, not necessarily on setup or anything like that, but maybe just in terms of the direction the team takes or just the general sort of feeling within the team as a whole. Plus, he is very, going to be very much the number one driver this season. No no disrespect at all to, to, to Martin Quar, but he's massively inexperienced in a Formula E car. Last season, Jeff was up against a Sam Bird that was, you know, massively loved by the DS Virgin team. You know, he is very, very well thought of within there and he was performing extremely well. And I think... This season, Jev's just got, you know, he knows he's got number one status. He's in a team where the setup is maybe more to his liking. And also, he knows that he's going to go to every single race with a chance of putting it on pole and winning because the powertrain is very good. To cheat last season as a Guri proved that they know how to set the car up well. They can develop the software over the course of a season because, you know, when they when that team was a Guri, it did a fantastic job of making a season one powertrain as competitive competitive as bespoke powertrains at different tracks at the end of the season as much as at the beginning of the season so actually the whole package Jeb has around him is a lot more positive so we've got Buemi, Degrassi, Generic Verne down as possible title contenders who are the others Sandbird at DS uh, yeah and obviously the interesting thing there is how uh, Jose Maria Lopez adapts because he's been tipped by Buemi and Degrassi as someone who will win races sooner rather than later and Lopez his pace at Donington compared really favourably to Sam on 200 kilowatt qualifying simulations compared well on long run pace. Sam now has his opportunity to show that last year he wasn't just a star in a, a starring underdog. You know, you you said as well, you maybe before that, you know, did he have that final little bit? I'm quite excited to see actually whether Sam can put it together because no expense has been spared on that DS package, which has been revised. It was last season a, a twin motor, single gear powertrain. I've ditched a second motor now. The weight is the priority. They've they've gone to town on the powertrain, so the package is going to be there. Actually, seeing how Sam utilises that is going to be quite interesting. Do you do you think they're actually going to be up there with with Renault though? Uh, I think so because the the raw pace in terms of and I, when I say raw pace, I mean qualifying sims was was very strong. But both both Sam and Pachito were were very good uh, on long run pace as well. And if you had a look at the third sector at Donington, which some people seem to think that the first sector's got some relevance, but I don't remember many Formula E circuits last year that had the Craner curves in them. So <laughs> I don't think that's particularly fair. <laughs> Beijing? No, that was just chicane. <laughs> yes, exactly. But the final sector at Donington, two chicane, uh, sorry, a chicane and two hairpins. 
Uh, so you've got, you know, you've got some some regen, you've got the car moving around, you've got, you know, heavy stops as well to, to deal with. And when you've got a car that's so oddly distributed towards the, the rear in terms of weight and low grip because of the tyres, lack of aero and stuff like that, you know, you actually get a better feel of what the car's doing. The DS Virgin cars were actually really quick in the final sector, even if the overall lap time was maybe a quarter of a second off Buemi's ultimate pace. So actually, I think they do go to, to Hong Kong with uh, certainly a much better chance of competing for the victory than they did in Beijing last year when the team was not just surprised, I think the team was actually quite lost. Obviously, you mentioned Lopez as the second driver there. There's also second drivers in an apt uh, in the form of Daniel Apt, obviously, and also Nico Prost at, at EDAMS. Do we expect to see much from either of them or do we think they're, they're the ones who will pop up with the good results on their day and underpin that with reasonable consistency but aren't quite in the class of the Degrassis and the Buemis. Prost got a lot to prove because he obviously ended the season with a double in Battersea Park, massively overshadowed by everything that happened in the title battle. Prost felt the first half of last season like nothing he could do would bring him good fortune. Examples like he was actually running quite well in Mexico. And if you remember, he picked up this bizarre unsafe release penalty there was nothing in it there was there was no real unsafe release there at all and he got given a drive through and it, it ruined his race and somehow i think when degrassi was excluded and a couple of things happened i think he still finished third or fourth but qu- qualify he was running quite well in mexico how high w- was he ahead of buemi he wasn't ahead of buemi well, but, he there we in, go. but he was in that lead he was in that lead group and m- my point is that what we saw in season one of formula e from from prost was certainly in the first half of the season was staggering i mm. think he exceeded everyone's expectations I feel like over the second half of the first season and the majority of last season, he regressed to the mean in terms of what we expected from him. He yeah. was such a clear number two in that team. So he's got a lot to prove. He needs to show that he, he didn't just fluke his way to, to the wins at the end of last season. He did seem to sort of have a bit of a rise in form towards the end of the year in general. And the same actually goes for Apt because second half of last season, as mentioned earlier, he was pushing Lucas in qualifying, out-qualified him a couple of times. He had two or three podiums in the second half of the season as well. Every driver in the field is less experienced in a Formula E car than, than Lucas because Lucas did the development work beforehand. So Apt has a really difficult person to be sort of comparing himself to. But the signs over the, car, over the course of last season was that he was actually finally starting to get on top of things. So it'll be interesting to see whether he can continue that. I mean, if you're going to compare the two, Apt has a much better chance of being closer and maybe challenging his teammate than, than than Prost. I agree. I think Daniel App was it 2012 in GP3 when it was he, Antonio Felix da Costa and Mitch Evans all going for the title. And you look at what da Costa has gone on and done and how much he's impressed everybody. So has Mitch Evans reasonably in, in GP2. And it hasn't quite worked out for Daniel Apt and it's been disappointing. I mean, he has he's had a Formula E pole position in Long Beach in season one. But the the Renault team last year had a double podium finish on one occasion. There was one occasion that the fastest car on the grid, both drivers were on the podium together. We saw quite a few Bohemi errors as well, didn't we? Because that played a part in Degrassi still being in the title hunt because he was able to be a little bit more consistent while Bohemi was having races where he's making life harder for himself with either his mistake or technical problems. In The the one error error you can definitely put down to Bohemi was Long Beach. Driving out the back of yeah, uh, driving out the back of Robin Frins's car, that was inexcusable at that stage of the race. And actually, in fairness to Buemi, the response afterwards was very much, oh, "I can't believe I did that. That was it was so foolish. I'm sorry to him. I'm sorry to the team." The problem is that the issues he had in qualifying in Punta del Este, in Buenos Aires, and in Mexico, where he had he made mistakes at 200 kilowatts in qualifying and locked up. Sometimes the mistakes were more costly than others. You know, Buenos Aires started at the back of the grid. Um, and he loves to point out to me at the moment that he charged from the back of the grid to, to second in the race. But the point is, you know, he was there because a mistake was made. The issue is that those three mistakes, they've been attributed to an issue on, on brake balance, which is supposedly caused by the buildup of rust, which is apparently because the cars where they were in transit from Putrajaya to Punta, they were basically it was the seawater from the harbour basically contributed to rust. And the idea is that you have such little preparation time in when these cars are in transit for the long haul flights, you have one day to build build the cars up. You're not looking for the final things like that. You're actually look you'd actually just 
chucking the cars together and making sure nothing's obviously broken. So there were obviously errors from the team and the driver last season, because don't forget that one of the races that Lucas won last year was the Renault team's home race in Paris. And that you know Renault was never in the running at that race because both Prost and Buemi had problems getting heat into the tyres. It was comfortably the coldest event I think Formula E had ever had. And they were massively caught out by it. And that was something the team should have done a better job there. And actually, Buemi probably should have done a better job in qualifying because I think that was actually one of the few races where Prost out qualified him. And, you know, he drove very well in the races. His recovery drives were always excellent. But, yeah, you you know, you're right. He, in, that, in that situation, it'll be interesting to see whether or not Buemi does up his game from a mistake-free point of view. And dark horses for the championship. This is one of those series that's got driver quality all the way through it. There's multiple guys in there who you think would be up to it, given the right machinery. Nelson Piquet Jr., Oliver Turve, Lode Duval, Jean D'Ambrosio, Felix Rosenquist, the newcomer, Nick Heidfeld. Win, win on the odd good day it needs to be the target for the Faraday-backed Dragon team. For Duval and D'Ambrosio. Duval and D'Ambrosio. No, they've got to challenge for the championship, haven't they? They've been, they've been the sort of just best of the rest, or another third place, or nearly a win for the last two years. I think you, if you carry on in that vein, you haven't made any progress. No, that's the that's looking at it from a natural progression point of view. I'm, I'm looking at it from a, what they've actually got to work with because one of the problems is the Mahindra team, which has obviously developed its own powertrain and did so last season, but this season's a very different. You know, they've got Magneti Morelli Motor, for example. Uh, it was no, put it this way, there's no coincidence that when Mahindra turned up to test uh, in, in uh, Califat in Spain that the Dragon team happened to be the testing at the same time. Now this is Dragon's first attempt at building its own powertrain. Uh, Faraday Future came on board far too late in the process to have any input into the powertrain. The My understanding is that Dragon maybe had a little bit of difficulty in the early phases in terms of putting stuff together or working out exactly who their partners were going to be. I'm not entirely sure. But what is definite is that they've worked very closely with Mahindra. And the suggestion at Donington Park was that Mahindra focused more on long run pace and then the Faraday guys, D'Ambrosio and Duval, did a lot of running at 200 kilowatts. So where one should be, the other should be for Mahindra and, and, and Dragon. The question is, will will Dragon actually... It's badged as its own powertrain. We shouldn't ignore that. It is, it is the, the, the Penske, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But... It, it's got Mahindra bits. That would, maybe maybe that's the best way to put it. So the question will be, can Duval and D'Ambrosio do what they did at, at times last season and outperform the team with a similar powertrain? Because they were Ven- they were using Venturi powertrains last season and for the most part of the season were better than the Ven- Venturi drivers. But on the Mahindra side, you know, Rosenfist, twice a winner of Macau, quality driver on street circuits, and I'm told his Macau prowess is basically the reason he was hired by Mahindra which is pretty cool for, yeah. for, for for Felix, who's obviously had a bit of a breakthrough this season after what felt like a decade of racing in Formula 3 underfunded. You know, if you're looking at that quartet of drivers that are in sort of similar, we think are using similar technology, I think your dark horse is Heidfeld. This is a guy who can't possibly go as many Formula E races as, without winning as he did in Formula 1. And, <laughs> well, he could try. And he's out. I'll tell you what, if, if he's, he, he's, yet to, he's yet to win one, although he came very, very close in the, the inaugural well, race. Well, I think I said it after the inaugural race that if Heidfeld manages to go as many Formula E races without winning as he did in Formula 1, that Formula E's going to have a bloody brilliant future. <laughs> but, you know, he, Heidfeld will also be 58. <laughs> yes, exactly. But, you know, I look Nick, forward to uh, celebrating his 183rd Formula E start to match his Formula 1 record. I think Heidfeld is a guy who is actually very, very much at home in, in Formula E. And he has he has pushed Mahindra so hard. Like last season there were some fantastic stories of just how you know how long the, the engineers had to, to to go over things in, in, in debriefs. You know, he was he was tightening up processes from from day one, basically. You know, Mahindra needs to make fewer mistakes. They they you know the team acknowledged that last season. And actually, if that powertrain is as good as it looks, you know, fastest lap wise, they didn't look necessarily quiet at the races. The fastest lap from uh, from the Faraday guys was about four tenths off Buemi's lap record at Donington. Mahindra's was a little bit further back. The suggestion from Mahindra was that 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 that, that team was focusing more on on long runs. And actually, if you have a look at the the long run averages, uh, they're sort of they're in that ballpark. You know, they're not. You know, they're just over half a second slower on average on long run paces than the DS Virgin guys. So then maybe not 
Mahindra and Faraday slash dragon is very difficult to actually know what's best to call that Faraday dragon partnership because Faraday dragon is actually now starting to sound like less and less of a thing. Dragon sounds the coolest. Yeah, dragon just sounds dragon. The coolest. Yeah, dragon. Just dragon. Dragon. Okay, fine. It's so easy. Mahindra and dragon. Yeah, that's very cool. Mahindra, good name for a band. Very good name for a band. Mahindra and dragon. Maybe not necessarily in that that top bracket. Renault E Dams, Tachita, Apt and DS, but not very far off. And probably those two teams are just a little bit ahead of Next DV. And we haven't really talked about this team very much at the moment, but Jaguars in that little group as uh, well. The elephants in the room or the Jaguar in the room. Yeah, well, we've already mentioned uh, one of the drivers. Much. M- M- yes. Much Evans. <laughs> yeah, Mitch Evans, who, you know, he's, he's a guy like. He's you know very similar to Apt in a way, who promised so much at the earlier phases of a junior single seater career, and then moved into GP two. He's in his fourth year now, and he's a multiple race winner. And it's a shame because I think Evans has become one of those drivers who there's now a bit of a negative perception of him because he's fourth, fourth year of GP two, and he's I think tenth in a the stand-ins. I mean, that's... Although he has won a feature race this year. So has, has, and you know, when the car's under him in GP2, he exactly. flies. No, he's, he's, in he's a class act, Mitch Evans. And he's got a deserved opportunity. I guess you could say the same thing for Adam Carroll as well. He's in the other seat. Well, you'll know him from, obviously, quite a lot of uh, GT racing. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's only, he hasn't done that much Blanc Pan, in actual fact. He's done a couple of races here and there and always been very impressive. I know him mainly, actually, from a night out in Buenos Aires last year when he turned up and almost raced for... Two different teams. For two different teams. <laughs> almost raced for Mahindra and then almost raced for Virgin, wasn't it? Yeah, but when... Because Jeff, Jeff was, was ill. Jeff was poorly. But then he didn't do either, so he came out and he taught... He knows an awful lot about red wine. Does he? Yeah, we were in this uh, in this restaurant and he said, oh, and he got out his app and he was looking at his app and, uh, yeah, knows a lot about red wine. And uh, I found out a lot about red wine. And anyway, but... Do you, know, uh, do you think that will help him? I think so, with, yeah. With He's going Especially, to be cracking yeah. form when we go to Buenos Aires. Again. Yeah, exactly. That was that was what was great. But anyway, I'm a bit nervous because I think Adam Carroll is excellent and I think he's always been excellent and is an excellent driver and coming up through the ranks, he was phenomenal and, uh, you know, won A1GP with Team Ireland back in the day and uh, I was actually in the grandstand at Brands Hatch that day you know, and it was great. So I think he's great. Were you commentating? No, I wasn't in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Fair (laughs) enough. There was a phenomenal Formula Junior race that weekend. Tremendous. But I just wonder if he's a bit old. I just wonder if he's a bit... Yeah. Adam Carroll. I just wonder if he's a bit... You know, you've got your Robin Franks. You've got Da Costa. I just wonder if he's been a bit long away from single-seaters to really mix it with what is an absolutely top-class field. And I think he's wonderful. And I think he really is an excellent driver. And I think he's one of the best... Uh, and the most, um, you know, one of the most unrewarded drivers, British drivers we've had in recent well, made, years. We made Autosports list of the top 50 drivers never to never to race in F1. But, that's a long time ago now. But, what I would say is, to use a cliche, you know, class is permanent. We know that he's, he's, he's top Jacques draw. Jacques Villeneuve. Stefan Sarrazin. Are we, just uh, na- uh, are we just naming drivers now? Yeah, I'm, my- I'm wondering if you're disagreeing with my point or agreeing with no, my I'm point. No, I'm disagreeing with your point. So okay, so you think so- Sarazan's been great? I, sa- in Formula E, Sarazan has been fantastic. Really? I can't speak for his uh, Toyota LMP1 form or what he's been doing when he rocks up to a random French or Italian rally. Event. Oh, he's amazing in rally. Yeah, he's Absolutely superb. Unbelievable. Quality all-rounder, actually, Sarazan. Doesn't get enough credit for that. But Sarazan, for me, I mean, I know you- I take your point that Carroll's not been in single-seaters for, for four years, but Villeneuve was totally irrelevant in motorsport for a long period of time before coming back in Formula E. Maybe even in 1997. Oh, that's well, <laughs> again, like I'll leave that for you to say. But Carol's Carol's main, remained active. He does he does a lot of driver coaching. He's a model professional. I, I absolutely and, agree, but I don't know if he's got that final nth degree thing. Do you have the same reservations about Lopez? Uh who has been even longer away from single seats? Well, quite I possibly, think. yeah. And is also a very similar age, thirty-three. Yeah, quite possibly, because I, I think I think you know there's a lot of adapting required to these Formula E cars, and and I'm obviously I'm not saying in your early thirties you're past it, but when you're up against these young hungry folk, all with something to prove, I don't know if Adam Carroll's got anything to prove. 
I love Adam Carroll. I want to make that absolutely clear. And I think he's wonderfully talented and I'd sign him for any team any day. But you not know your what I'm team. Saying? Not your team. Oh, no, not my team, but you'd any other team. Him, you'd recommend him to someone else. <laughs> he's not driving for your single seater team. No, exactly. That's the point you make. I think I think with 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 Carroll, what you've got there is a driver who has been desperate for a shot with a factory team his entire career. You know, actually it's it's really easy to to forget because because it never materialised. But when there was the influx of new teams in Formula One and Lola was evaluating a Formula One entry, Carroll was part of that plan. And it relied on the team bringing in some sponsors. Is that... this seven years ago you're talking? Yeah. Just but, checking. Yeah, but my point is that that would have been the shot that Carroll's career deserved. And as much as he will say, you know, he's incredibly proud of what he achieves and he should be. You know, he's a world, he's one of the rare motorsport world champions mm. because of A1 Grand Prix. Um, was, that a world, was that a world championship? World Cup of Motorsport. So we'll call him a world champion. Okay, uh, okay. So he's not a world champion in the sense that... <laughs> I think, you'll, not find that, I think champion. you'll find that Ireland was champion in that. Not a driver. There's no yeah. driver in the car. <laughs> Absolutely. Mark Gallagher <laughs> is world champion. But my point is that with for someone like Carroll, this is, this is the shot that he spent years and years trying to get in single-seaters. And he's, he's done very well to make a professional career out of motorsport from a coaching perspective, from driving GTs. But this is what he wants. He's so excited to be going back to his roots, as, as, he, as he puts it. I, I don't think there's going to be any lack of motivation in his part to, 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 to prove himself. The big question is, though, for all this talk about drivers, what do we expect from this? Is it going to be in the, in the game, I guess, for a first season? You know, if they're in the spread, if they're even in the lower midfield, you think that's a, that's a pretty good baseline point. But what do we expect from Jaguar? Are they going to be playing catch up and just be driving around at the back? Well, they need to be in the mix for starters, don't they? They need the, they they just need to be sort of in that ballpark. And if if they're in, in that, what ballpark? In the ballpark of being sort of with being able to be competitive in terms of fighting for the top ten. Objective one is don't be last every race. That's I guess is the. Uh, I don't think, I, like, I don't, don't always be I last t- in qualifying. I tell you what though, they <laughs> are um, they they have already massively massively exceeded obviously the team that they took over because truly. Managed, oh, they got on track. Truly managed more aborted attempts at starting a Formula E event last season than they did laps in pre-season, <laughs> which is pretty good going um, for for Jaguar. You know what they're saying at the moment initially is they wanted to achieve reliability. Well, they've smashed that out of the park. You know the fifth highest tally of the ten teams in terms of laps completed at Donington, and a lap tally that I believe would have put them second overall this time last year and you've got to compare where they are at the moment to where they where the other teams were last year in terms of how prepared they are but obviously that doesn't really help when all the other teams have moved on so much in in 12 months from what we saw at Donington I think you've got just over a second off the pace in terms of qualifying trim and maybe a couple of seconds off on long runs but again that will con- that will condense by the time we get to street circuits so th- you say they're within a second that immediately puts them in the fight to not be last at every race, which would obviously be pretty disastrous, I think, for yeah. a manufacturer of Jag standards. But so tip the don't be last box. Don't be they, last. They, that's they, that's, that's the first one. Don't don't stop on track. And apart from I think one stoppage for Evans in the first test on his first day in the car, I don't recall Jaguar causing any other red flags at Donington. You you will they will encounter problems. I mean they've encountered problems nowhere near the significance of Trulli's and Andressi's last season. Yeah. And obviously their total count at the end of the the six days of running was 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 so spot on that you, I don't really think you can fault their reliability because there were there were stories coming out of private testing that they were in trouble mm. as a, as an organisation. You know Williams Advanced Engineering, which has got a partnership with 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 Jaguar for for this entry, and obviously Jaguar likes to point out one team and and all this, and they've we've got JLR engineers and Williams Advanced Engineering engineers embedded within this team, but the WAE guys have no experience of running race cars until they brought in Patrick Corey, Sam Bird's engineer at DS last season. He joined for the first day, for the second day of the second test, I think. You know, until they'd done that, they had no one in their team that had worked on a Formula E event, worked on a car at a Formula E event. He'll be a loss, actually, to DS Virgin. Yeah, absolutely. Pat- Patrick's a lovely guy. I had yeah. quite a good chat with him at, in, in I Paris think I think season. Sam Bird might uh, not struggle without him, but I think it'll be a different dynamic yeah, but anyway definitely. that's a different and point. also actually um Corey and carol worked together i think about 11 years ago okay that's some like a bit of sort of friends reunited there but my, my point about <laughs> my, my, my point about <laughs> that's an up-to-date reference exactly. for the uh 
for the younger audience. Yeah, for that's about as old as Adam Carroll. I'm surprised, yeah. you, I'm surprised you remember. Yeah, yeah. I was only born 10 minutes ago. I think, I think if Jaguar don't finish the championship in the top five in the teams, it will have been a massive failure. I think the amount of money that they're ploughing into it, I think the lead up time they had, I think that there's there's no excuse. If you, if last year you look at the pace that Aguri and Andretti churned out using season one technology, you know, with a little bit of upgraded software, and I'm not meaning to decry software because obviously it was vitally important. It was what most of the development was last year, but I, I don't think, okay, Renault, Apt maybe, DS, the big three, plus Techita with the Renault powertrain, I think then you've got to have Jaguar there. If Jaguar are beaten by, you know, your sort of independence, as it were, like your Andrettis and your Next EVs and your Venturis, I think that's a, I think that's a failure. I don't think um, the the lead time that they had is actually um, significant in the slightest. And when, no, I, when, I, when because... I say significant, I, I actually mean uh, significant in terms of they didn't have enough time. The the lead time was not was not long at all. When you what, think, what was the lead time? So, I guess that's the question. So when did this project start? So the entry was confirmed in December, but they were working with that in mind in November, I right, I believe. So you a look, year? No, it's not. So a, a year? No, it's not a year because it's, and you you start crash testing in April. So you're you, while well, while the final product isn't homologated until the first of June, you have April really. You need to have pretty much your finished product by April so it's four months now I'm told that actually if you wanted to properly develop your own motor you're looking at a 14 month development development cycle the other teams have got look at how much more so you're, sorry so you're telling me that Renault started their season 2 powertrain the before Formula E had started uh, they, they would have started before that. Formula E had started the season, they'd built their the powertrain season, no they hadn't built it but the work that goes into the powertrain for the big teams that could have put those resources into it would have started at the end of 2014 so what you what you've got there is for last season, with the exception of Renault, which ploughed, I believe, more money than anyone else into the championship last season, look at how so, how gradual the, the changes were from the base powertrain in season one to what most teams went for in season two. And now look at how the teams that went for four gears, for example, in their gearbox last season, if you like some Mahindra and Venturi, have now stepped up to where Apt and Renault were last year. So what, so what I'm saying is that Unless you had masses of resources to to throw at it, like Jaguar, for example. Well, <laughs> you can say that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what resources are we what resources are we talking about? So, I guess that's a good question. So Jaguar, how much are people spending on on Formula Renault? So, for example, the paddock rumor put the Renault spend last year at around ten million euros, and the suggestion, the speculation this time around is that there are now three teams that are spending that figure. If you were going to take a guess, you'd say Renault, DS, and and Jag. Hmm. But while money buys you a lot and the, res- the facilities that they've got at their disposal with obviously what everything Williams has got and the massive engineering expertise at JLR, that's going to be huge. But it's going to be something that in terms of long-term development, that's where it's going to have its impact. You know, what I would say is that Jaguar needs to target, Jaguar needs to target at the very least respectability in the championship out the box, which is you're, you're talking top six in terms of teams and then from the following season like they've got to come in with the best powertrain for yeah. for, for 2017 but you can't underestimate the amount of development and data that everyone's collected over the last 18 months basically it the Jag, jaggy was not lying when they say that the rivals have got a year a year and a half head start okay but andretti mahindra next ev venturi all with new powertrains all with massively less funding than Jaguar, all with, I'd imagine, a kind of similar lead time. Andretti didn't start their season two powertrain until July, until the end of, till London had finished in season one. And that didn't obviously go very well because that was nuts and they couldn't even get out of the garage. So they had to go back to season one, but they haven't got that much more. If they abandon, if Andretti, for example, abandoned their season two powertrain in what, August, and you're saying that uh, Jaguar with their, 10 million quid started in November they've got to be beating Andretti I don't think it's unrealistic for them to 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 win or to maybe sneak a win this season or fight for the podium at times but I think it's optimistic to to, to think that I just think that the challenges that they actually face Formula E has new challenges from a technical point of view and the traditional old school motorsport challenges that look at 
when you have single make series like GP two, for example, how the difference in spread between the best team and the worst. Yeah, 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 yeah. but 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 that that's irrelevant. Saying saying oh some teams do a good job, some teams do a bad job. And so you have to do a good job. Yeah, absolutely. You look. You use the Toyota one as an example. The money doesn't guarantee success. Toyota and Honda, billions of pounds probably into Formula One. It was a failure. So that's what I'm saying. Okay, the money doesn't guarantee a success. But if you don't get the success with all that money, it's a failure. What you shouldn't say is that they've got this money. It has to. It. it they should succeed straight away. My my point. I don't think they go to Hong Kong as a team that should go there expecting to fight for the win no 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 i I never said fight for the win i said that anything less than fifth in the championship is a failure if they're wallowing around all yay we qualified 17th it's not good enough next dv yeah which never actually in fairness to next dv celebrated occupying the back row of the grid for their home race no no, exactly i I think you know you look at the venturis and the mahindras and um andretti to an extent just far too inconsistent if you my point is if you go in there with all that money and do a good job, you've got to finish in the top five in the championship. And it's all very well saying, oh, but it's you know it's difficult to do that. Well, yeah, well, that's motorsport. I guess the definition of, of failure is whether you see what Jaguar wants to achieve and what it should be achieving in this championship over one season or not. Because my, like, my point is that they should be respectable this year. And I'm not saying that they should be respectable from an expectations point of view. In terms of quality and what they achieve, I think they... They should be respectable. They, I think that's what they will achieve, respectability. And then when you actually have the, when you work within the reality of the situation and you say it's the longer term ambitions must be higher, I actually think that yeah. they need to make this, I think they need to make an enormous step between season three and season four. I don't think it's a failure if they are, if they struggle to score points really? in, in this season. No, because, really? no, because you've got, I get, I I get what you're saying about long term, obviously. Got, but if, if you, if, Regardless of what you think of the second driver in Tachita or, or Renault Edams, you've got you've got two drivers in uh, uh, at Renault. You've got two drivers at Tachita. You've got two drivers at Apt. Yeah. You've got two drivers at DS Virgin. Yeah. And those four teams will be starting ahead of everyone else. They should be. So therefore, you. Uh, uh, I, this then, is why I literally keep saying they sh- anything less than fifth is a failure. Yes. But this this seems to be an argument about a very like very, round very, round. A very very small difference. <laughs> yeah. One of you seems to say, "Well, they might be six in the championship." Yeah. The other one says, "No, anything we'll worse we'll than fifth that. is we'll dreadful." My, my this, po- this is a brilliant. No, my point is that I think they'll be fighting for that fifth or sixth spot. But I'm, I'm saying it wouldn't be a disaster if they ended up seventh or eighth. Okay, well it, it would. It, okay, but that's the disagreement. <laughs> predictions is a brilliant topic, so I'm going to try and get uh, Scott and Jack to come to blows over this. So I want some I want some quick predictions here. Drivers champion. Boemi. Oh, there's a long pause. Sam Bird. Oh, controversial. I would like. I, I want to go. Well, no, hang on. You don't. How, how you've done you... it. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not changing my mind. I want to go on record and say Vern will get more poles than any other driver this season. I think he could get five, six poles. I would. I'd love it if he won a race, at, at least one, because you know he's a, he is a nice guy. He's very, very quick, and I, I hope he's I hope he takes the opportunity he's got in front of him. I think he'll get more poles than anyone else. I, I'm I'm not bold enough to make a prediction on how many races he'll convert that pole into. Good job no one asked you then, isn't it? Really? <laughs> Other things I haven't been asked to predict. Um, well, I've, nobody's asked me to predict, but I'm going to go for uh, Lucas Degrassi for champion. Uh, best rookie, obviously, Jose Maria Lopez, Felix Rosen, Chris, Mitch Evans, Adam Carroll. Plenty of new drivers out there. You're ruling out Engel as well. I say, you're ruling out Engel. Well, no, no, I, uh, I am. I, I ignored him temporarily, but. You know, best rookie, and that can be most impressive, not necessarily the best ranked. Who's going to be the one that people look at and say, yeah, that, that's a serious drive? Felix Rosenquist, by a mile, because mega in Formula 3, uh, and he turned up in the wonderful Blancpain GT series, uh, driving for Acura SP. Your check's in the post, by the way. Yeah, merci, Monsieur Blancpain. And um, he was tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Him and Tristan Vautier shared a car. Oh, he's just phenomenal, Rosenquist. I think he's wonderful. I think he's I think he's standout top debutant this year. I, I unless was... do you put Martin Hua in debutant or no? He did some last no, year. That doesn't count. Okay, no, fine. But well, then yeah, I won't pick him. Days. I'll say Felix Rosenquist. Would, would you have Would you have gone for Mar if he was eligible? <laughs> well, I would have considered him. He's in the mix. He is in the mix. <laughs> Everyone will be considered. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm torn between Rosenquist and Evans on on the grounds. We'll that... say Evans on the grounds that Jack did. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So I I, I never. <laughs> then, that's, that's how this works. I never yeah. considered Rosenquist. Uh, I think actually Evans <laughs> Evans by a long way, and he could do basically 
in a way, what Turvey did last year. I think Turvey impressed so many people who didn't really know what Turvey was about beforehand because he's an understated driver, Turvey. He's not, because he's not been in the public eye as a racer for, for, for a little while because of his McLaren role. Maybe people thought coming in as a rookie against PK, you know, you do a solid job. And, you know, most of the time last season, I think Turvey actually blew PK out of the water. So Evans actually has the opportunity at Jag to have that kind of impact. So I think Rosenfist, as you've picked him, I think Rosenfist will maybe achieve the bigger results. So I was right. No, no, because results aren't everything, are they? What a thing to say. I would like to point out that they're not everything (laughs) because who was number one in my driver list last season and where did he finish in the championship? Yeah, but this, but yeah, 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 yeah. But that doesn't count because Jaguar are going to be better than Mahindra. If and where? No, hang on. And he finished number one because of the results he got in a bad car. Robin I mean, Franks, we're talking about. Uh, sorry, how, how did he get number one otherwise? <laughs> if it wasn't his results, because bribery. No, because of his performance. He's a lovely, in races lo- he's a lovely chap. Performances in races don't always translate into good results because you can get taken out. You can have mechanical failures. Literally anything can happen, and it usually does. So, That's a cliche for Jack to you. But th- <laughs> yeah, this, exactly. this conversation's We're going round irrelevant. and round again. Well, you've been arguing about Rose and Crest Evans, but it's going to be Jose Maria Lopez at DS Virgin. Really? So move on to the next point. <laughs> why, why Lopez? Why Pachito? Lopez, outstanding driver. That's a start. In a good car. Well, a good team, should we say. They're all a uh, similar car. Uh, you know, the Virgin he, DSV powertrain. He is, says everything he achieves in touring cars with Citroën means nothing for Formula E. Do you believe him? Uh, no, I don't believe him because... It doesn't necessarily mean what you've learned specifically translates, but their skill sets, approaches, you know, the fundamental ability of the driver. He learned moving into WTCC. Okay, moving from touring cars in Argentina to world touring cars, not such a big leap, but still going up against serious drivers. You know, Ivan Muller, who, okay, he's getting on a bit, but has been one of the best touring car drivers in the world. He's destroyed him over three seasons. But Lopez is a, has always been a seriously good driver, and he's with a good team, so... It's going to be him. Fact. Now, <laughs> we also have a few new races this year. So, which one are we getting most excited about? Hong Kong? No. Morocco? No. What else have we got? New York. Got, uh, Belgium, Brussels. Surely Brussels is more exciting than New York. Montreal as well. Montreal's going to be quite cool, actually. Montreal. Proper downtown Montreal. Sunday, Montreal, my 25th birthday. So, the Autosport coffee better be wrapped up pretty swiftly after the race <laughs> on Sunday. Well, good? no, you're in trouble, actually, aren't you? Because um, America's behind. So, you've got to get it done quicker, haven't you? That's why I said I hope it gets wrapped up with yeah, the after exactly. race. Um, now, Montreal will be really cool because uh, I I, really, I went to Montreal for the first time this year for the Grand Prix and it's really cool, except That's a it's, a bit, it's a bit of a trek to the track. That's what I love about Formula E. We, we're, we're in Singapore That's this weekend. The track comes to you. Exactly. In Singapore, we were all we we're just walking and some, uh, someone else was like, oh, isn't it great when you just walk to the track? I was like, yeah, this is Formula E. So, <laughs> lots to look forward to in Formula E this year with the first race in Hong Kong on October the 9th. There'll be full coverage on autosport.com and in Autosport magazine, most of it provided from Scott Mitchell. And for those in the UK, television coverage will be on Channel 5, the new home this year. So uh, thank you very much, Jack Nichols, and to Scott Mitchell. Pleasure. And uh, everybody enjoy the Formula E season. am by tree low written by marcus simmons see soundcloud.com forward slash tree low music